Today, we're gonna have a look at the Necron Doomsday Arc, the best heavy supports choice in the Codex. It's time for some advanced Warhammer 40K Necrons tactics. It's coming right up. Necrons! Necrons! Nick speaking and welcome to this video and if you're new to the channel and you want to keep up to date with the wonders of Warhammer 40k then please subscribe and hit the bell button so you don't miss an upload and remember I upload on a Monday, Thursday and Saturday every week. Okay so in this week's Necron video we're going to have a chat about the Necron Doomsday Arc what is now almost definitely the best heavy supports choice in the Codex. Chapter Approved has reduced the points of this model, which was already one of the best units anyway, and now it just got better. Poor Monoliths, such a classic unit, even with the points reduction, useless. Now personally, I am a big fan of the Monolith, however, even with the points reduction, they aren't very good. Now of course, there's reasons why a Doomsday Arc is a lot better than the Monolith. GW know that a lot of old Necron players already own one or two monoliths. And of course GW want to sell more models, so they make the Doomsday Arc, which a lot of old Necron players won't have, more viable. It makes good business sense, right? Or at least, this is my guess anyway. Let me know what you think in the comments box below. So let's have a closer look at the Doomsday Arc and work out the best way to use it on the table. Okay, so the Doomsday Arc, which has come down to 160 points in Chapter Proved, that's a reduction of 33 points. At full strength, it can move 12 inches, it's got a weapon skill of 6 plus, a ballistic skill of 3 plus, it's strength 6 and toughness 6 with 14 wounds. It has a leadership of 10 and a 4 plus save. It has living metal, allowing it to regain one wound per turn, and it does explode on a six if it's destroyed. It also has quantum shielding. Now, quantum shielding is one of its defense capabilities. We're going to talk more about that later. Now, my Doomsday Arc is magnetized, so I can have it as a ghost arc if I wish as well. I do have a tutorial on how to do that, and I'll link you up to that tutorial in the description below. Now the magnets are very useful on the gauze flayers, allowing me to move these around if I need to position it into an awkward place. If these were glued into position, that wouldn't be quite so easy to do. Now in terms of dynasties, there's two dynasties which benefit the Doomsday Arc the most. You have the Nihilic dynasty, which allows you, if you stand still, which the Doomsday Arc has to do to shoot its Doomsday Cannon at the top profile, the Nihilic Dynasty lets you re-roll the ones to hit. Now that is pretty useful. However, the Sotek Dynasty, which is one of the best dynasties in the Necron Codex at the moment, is probably the one you're going to be taking. Now the Sotek Dynasty has the advantage allowing you to advance and shoot the weapon as an assault weapon or to move and shoot the heavy weapon with no penalties. Not the top profile because the rules stipulate you can't shoot that at all at its top profile. However, you can move and shoot the second tiered profile. And the second tiered profile is still pretty good. So the low power profile is 36 inches. It's heavy D6 strength 8, minus 2, and d3 damage. However, what we're more interested in is shooting the gun at high power. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so the Doomsday Cannon at high power is 72 inches. That's huge for Necrons, a massive range, which we don't really have in any other unit on the table. It's a heavy d6 at strength 10, minus 5 AP, and does d6 damage. And like I said, if you move, you can't shoot the gun at that top profile. Now one issue which we have with this particular gun, of course, is that it's random. So it's between one and six shots, depending on what the dice say, and then one to six damage. So again, you're relying on the dice rolls. However, now that the Doomsday Arc, along with most of the other units in the Codex, 
have come down in points that sort of compensates for the fact that this tank is random. Now to help get over the randomness of the Doomsday Arc, you could take more than one. This means that if you fail to hit with one of them, you've got a second chance, or if you take three, you've got a third chance. In actual fact, this is how people have overcome the issues with the Doomsday Arc in the past. And now with cheaper, of course, that's easier to do. Now personally, I generally only use two Doomsday Arcs, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I only have two models at the moment, built and painted. And the second reason for that is I find it easier to deploy two Doomsday Arcs than three. Three is just an awkward number, especially for using the mirror deployment tactics. Now I've made a video on the mirror deployment tactics, and again, I'll link you up to that in the description below. Now of course the Doomsday Arc also has these Gauss flayers just on the side. We'll talk more about those later. But first of all I want to talk about the weaknesses of this model. So one weakness is it's only toughness 6. Running alongside that it only has a 4 plus save. It's quite difficult to get cover saves with these models as well. So in many cases you won't actually be getting a save at all. If somebody puts some dedicated anti-tank guns into these tanks. Now the Doomsday Arc is also quite vulnerable in the assault. Only 14 wounds, again with that toughness and save, you could easily take this thing out. However, we do have one thing up our sleeve and that's the quantum shielding. Now the way quantum shielding works is when you take damage, whatever damage you take, you roll a dice and if you roll under the damage, then you ignore the damage totally. So if your opponent rolls a 4 and then you roll a 3, you don't get the damage at all. Now this is really useful and it works in close combat really nice. However, of course, the problem that you have is once somebody knows how to negate your quantum shielding, which can easily be done by shooting weapons that don't do that much damage. If you get hit by weapons that just do two or three damage points, it can be hard to save those with your quantum shielding, and then your 14 wounds can easily whittle down. Now we do have a couple of stratagems to help us out with the Doomsday Arc, so let's look at those next. Okay, so the first one is quantum deflection. This is one command point and can be very useful. So effectively, whatever you roll for your quantum shielding dice roll, you minus one from it. So if your opponent shoots you and does four damage, then you roll a four, you can minus one on that, taking it to a three, thus ignoring the damage. So this could be very useful if someone does shoot you with those lower damage weapons. If they're shooting you with fixed three damage weapons, that means you can save your quantum shielding on a three rather than a two. Now remember, if you get hit by a weapon that does more than six damage, you don't even have to roll the dice for quantum shielding. They can't actually hurt you. And indeed, if you get hit by a weapon that does six damage and you use the quantum deflection stratagem, Again, you don't even have to roll the dice, because if you did roll a six, that would become a five and you would automatically stop the damage from happening. Now the next stratagem is very useful for Doomsday Arcs. Damage Control Override. For one command point, you can shoot your Doomsday Arc as if it was on its top tier. So if you have a badly damaged Doomsday Arc, for one command point, this card is definitely well worth considering. Now the other way to help with the weakness of the Doomsday Arc's survivability is to take a Cryptek with a Canoptek Cloak. Now this gives us D3 Living Metal on one of our Doomsday Arcs rather than just one. Now you could use Tomb Spiders with the Fabricator Claw to do the same. However, as a unit itself, the Cryptic is a better choice. There's many reasons why, but one of them is, of course, that it can't be targeted as it's a character and it's under 10 wounds. Now the other way to help with the survivability of the Doomsday Arcs is in deployment. And that's what we're going to have a look at next. Okay, so deployment. Now 8th edition terrain has changed a little bit from what we've always had in the past. Now it's all about line of sight blocking pieces of terrain. Now these pieces of terrain generally are quite tall. 
usually buildings or ruined buildings or some form of obelisk or tower. Now that means that we have a slight advantage with the Doomsday Arcs in 8th edition. The Doomsday Arc is a vehicle, however it can also fly, which means you can deploy the Doomsday Arc up on a building. Now Doomsday Arcs don't really want to move anyway because they want to shoot their big gun at the high profile. That means if we can place our Doomsday Arc at the top of the building, you're going to get A, good line of sight, and B, you're going to be protected from certain units that can't go up a building. Now if you can put the Doomsday Arc on a level of the building that other models can't get onto either, then again, that's really useful. That stops quite a bit of the assault issues that we have. People are going to have to shoot at the Doomsday Arc, and unless they have the right weapons, i.e. low damage weapons, it could be quite difficult for them to take a Doomsday Arc out. Now if you're lucky and you get to the right pieces of terrain in your deployment zone, you could potentially deploy both of your Doomsday Arcs high up. Very, very useful. Now there's an argument for deploying the Doomsday Arcs together, and there's an argument for deploying them far apart as I've got them now. It really does depend on the army that you're facing. Now if I was facing an elite army that didn't have too many units, I would deploy them quite far apart. This allows me to spread my opponent out. If he wants to come towards my Doomsday Arcs, he's going to have to make a choice. He probably will target one side of the board. I would imagine you'll probably have the rest of your force on this side of the board as well. It means, yes, your Doomsday Arc over the other side could be a little bit more vulnerable. However, it means that if he does attack one side of the board, either this side or this side, you've still got the other Doomsday Arc to shoot. Now, talking of shooting, let's talk about the Gauss Flayers. Now, these weapons are not to be sniffed at. They are short-ranged, so 24 inches. However, they are rapid fire. So if your opponent does get close, these guns here can actually pump out quite a few shots. Now the downside of these guns is they're only strength 4. So of course if you're shooting at something with toughness 8, you'll be wounding on 6s. However, if it's toughness 5 or 6, you'll be wounding on 5s, and that's not bad. And of course if you're shooting against toughness 4 or less, even better. You've got a good amount of shots coming out and they're minus one AP. Pretty useful, especially if your opponent is close and can't get up to your Doomsday Arc. Now, if you were deploying your Doomsday Arcs at each end of the table, you have a couple of options. Like I said, you could put the rest of the force here, maybe over one side, or you could put the rest of the force in the middle. So you might deploy something like that. We've got the Cryptic, we've got a couple of squads of Destroyers, we've got a line of Scarabs at the front for our Bubble Wrap, and then we've got the Triarch Stalker, which is where I'm going to go next. So the Triarch Stalker is a great complement unit to two Doomsday Arcs. I like to use the twin Heavy Gauze Cannons, giving me that reach with the guns at 36 inches, and also the damage capabilities. The Triarch Stalker has come down in points now to 125 points with that weapon option. So a little bit cheaper than Doomsday Arc. There is an argument for saying, well, why take the Triarch Stalker? Let's just have another Doomsday Arc. Like I said, I find it easier to deploy two Doomsday Arcs. Plus, the Triarch Stalker has targeting relay, which is not only going to benefit the Doomsday Arcs, it's going to benefit the rest of the army as well. Now, the way the targeting relay works on the Triarch Stalker is once you select a unit as a target with the Stalker, which you do before the rest of the army shoots, anything else that shoots at that unit will be able to re-roll the ones. And that's what I really like about the Triarch Stalker. It means that I can take my Doomsday Arcs in the Sotek Dynasty and then use the Triarch Stalker's ability to re-roll the ones for the Doomsday Arcs as if they were in the Nihilic Dynasty, the best of both worlds. And of course with the Sotek Dynasty, we can take the Warlord trait, which allows us to get our CPs back on a five plus. Very useful indeed. Now of course, we may not necessarily have buildings or other pieces of terrain that we can actually place our Doomsday Arcs on. So if that's not the case, how do we deploy them? Now of course, you could still deploy them exactly as we've already done. 
However, they're going to be a little bit more vulnerable without the high level of the buildings. So you might want to protect them, maybe throwing a scarab unit over one side to use as a bubble wrap. They may be deploying the rest of the army over the other side with the other Doomsday Ark. Of course, you could deploy both the Doomsday Arcs behind your scarabs. Then when the game starts, you can start to move the rest of the force out in front of your Doomsday Arcs. Don't forget, of course, the Crypt Tech, who, if you can get in range of both the Triarch Stalker and the Doomsday Arcs, you can choose where he puts his special living metal rule. Now, with the points reductions in the Codex, Heavy Destroyers have come down to 50 points a model from 57. There is an argument for Heavy Destroyers as a heavy support slot in your army. Personally, I find Doomsday Arcs are more survivable and more reliable in shooting, even though they are still random. However, we will look at Heavy Destroyers in another video. Okay, there you go. That's what I think of the Doomsday Arc. Let me know what you think in the comments box below. And if you're not subscribed yet, start now. Hit the Idik Beer icon. And if you want to see more advanced Necron tactics, then check out that playlist just there. Beam me up.